now like to introduce you to Manda Hobbs, who will be our presenter today. Manda is a physical therapist and clinical program consultant for ACP based in North Carolina. So thank you so much, Manda, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us today. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you guys all for joining the webinar today on DOR leadership. We are going to be focusing on managerial strategies to help support and drive the ACP programs in your facilities. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that both the on-site therapy manager as well as the regional therapy managers play significant roles in the successful implementation of the ACP programs. So today we're going to be taking a look at some leadership ideas and techniques that you can use and you can implement on a daily, weekly, or even maybe monthly basis that will assist with the program development, technology integration, and therapist accountability for that implementation. Before we get into some of those ideas, it is important to understand why these programs deserve our focus and deserve our attention. If we kind of take a step back and think about you know, some of the reasons why we actually became therapists to begin with and, and why we continue to show up at work every day. And hopefully, you know, some of those core reasons why might be that, you know, we're really looking to improve our patients' people's lives, improve them by improving their functional mobility because they've gone through some sort of ailment or um, had an exacerbation of a program, a surgery, whatever it might be, and ultimately to help them experience a better quality of life. Right, so if we kind of embrace that statement and we think about the things that we can do to contribute to that end result, um, we need to, to recognize and, and realize that as a leader of the therapy team, you, you do play a, a big role in that and you can help the patients achieve these functional mobility improvements and ultimately improve their quality of life by taking a few extra steps on a regular basis to um, help drive the programs. And so when we think about strong clinical programming, um, we as clinicians at, at, at heart want to know that what we're recommending, what we're doing with our, our patients actually works, right? That it has a, a proven track record of doing just that, right? So in thinking about ACP specifically, it's really important to recognize that there is solid research to support that implementation of our programs and technologies really do help make that positive impact for our patients. So, you know, that being said, I do want to review just one of the many outcome studies that have uh, demonstrated those positive outcomes, uh, just to kind of help give us kind of more of that why behind, uh, you know, the reasons that we want to really drive the programs in our facilities. So the Moran Group is actually a think tank out of D.C. Uh, they're an independent healthcare research firm, and they were tasked with the uh, retrospectively looking at over 25,000 Medicare A stays uh, in the SNF uh, settings. And this was done with one of our larger partners, and they um, you know, have many, many facilities out there, and, and they've been longstanding with us, and they've implemented our programs and our modality interventions and they wanted to know, is it really working, right? So over a 17-month period, they were evaluating based on the care instrument tool, assessment tool is one of the things that they looked at. And they looked at patients who had received modality integration uh, versus those who had, had not received any in their plan of care, okay? And so when we take a deeper dive into some of those specific outcomes, we will notice that there was some significant differences between the two groups. And so when we look at the care assessment tools, self-care scores for the modality group, and these are folks who received one or more modalities, so they actually did, were being billed for these, so they did receive them. They weren't just on the plan of care. Uh, they actually received the modality. They experienced a 38% improvement in their self-care scores, and then a 66% percent improvement in their mobility score. So that's pretty significant. When we compare it to the non-modality group, their results are down here. They had a 27% and a 43% in those same categories. So we're looking at a difference, uh, you know, the modality group overperforming uh, versus the non-modality group by 11 and 23%. So that's pretty, 
pretty good uh, results there. Another really important takeaway from this particular study is that the modality group actually started out at a lower average score in both categories when you compare to the starting score in the non-modality group. Yet they ended up at a higher ending score than the non-modality group. And I think that's pretty significant. So that's really telling us that the modality group were more debilitated at the beginning, yet outperformed and did much better, did better than the non-modality group in the end. So those are some pretty neat reasons why we want to kind of promote these programs because we're finding that they really do have that positive impact on outcomes that we're hoping to achieve with our patients. Another takeaway from the study is that there was not a significant increase in the time spent treating these patients uh, with the modality group. And so on average, just four additional minutes were spent when modalities were incorporated. So not only have we seen how they're very effective to achieve excellent outcomes, but they also are efficient. And that's really important in this day and age. We're, we're tasking our clinicians to be much more efficient with their time, yet to see better outcomes with that efficiency. So there is a way to do it, and it does sometimes take therapist creativity, thinking outside the box on how they can do a task. And we'll kind of talk about some of those uh, methods and strategies a little bit later. The bottom line is that better outcomes are seen when ACP programs are, and technologies are used with patients, and knowing that they can have such a positive impact on patient outcomes and seeing it supported by research, hopefully that's going to be a motivation to you to continue to support and really help foster these uh, programs and their development in the facilities. So as a therapy leader, we're gonna kind of get into the how do we do this and how do we support them? So as a leader of your department, your role can really make or break a therapy team's success with the integration of the ACP programs. One of the first things that you can do to foster success is to really understand all the resources and services that your clinical program consultant can provide. So we really want you to leverage their expertise, right? So when we think about the education, that's kind of been what the consultants have been known for, coming in and teaching the CE courses. Uh, that classroom style training is certainly a way that we can deliver our message and deliver that education to the staff. We can also do informal labs, hands-on hand, uh, hands education for clinicians. When we think about some, some clinicians doing better with one-on-one -on -one training, that certainly can be something that's set up reviewing clinical reasoning. This is something that I know I do as a, as a consultant all the time. You know, we're, we're telling them what to use, when to use it, how often, but most importantly, why to use it, right? So making sure that they really appreciate that physiological benefit, that clinical value that it's providing for their patients. Um, that's really important. Caseload review is always something I'm very fond of doing with clinicians. It can help open their eyes to potential modality uh, interventions or, or technology interventions, program uh, protocols or interventions for them as well, for patients as well. And so taking a deep dive into that caseload, what are you working on with that patient? What are your goals with that patient? How can our programs potentially help you achieve those goals? Are you having any barriers that you're facing with that patient? Maybe there's something that can be integrated. So that's a very useful thing uh, and can be very helpful. Help identify a program cha champion. So we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but if you do have a, a specific program focus at the building, developing a team leader uh, with your therapy staff can be important, that champion. We can help develop their expertise in that specific area so they can be the go-to person on site when questions arise on a certain program. We're available for interdisciplinary in-services for nursing, marketing, and administration. We can also attend rehab and facility meetings with you to help with screening or program identif identification. 
analyzing the usage trends, uh, looking at how frequently are the, the uh, modalities or the interventions being done, right? So really helping you to understand how to analyze the uh, reports such as the service code usage or the CPT utilization reports. <laughs> that can be really important. Review of current research and recommendations. We also have monthly clinical tips that we can go over and review with your staff. Creating formal success stories. So when you have those great moments with your patients where they're discharged and they're super happy and they, you really found that some of the programming that, that you provided for them was very beneficial and uh, they liked it and everybody's happy. Creating those success stories can be a really good, great way to boost morale in the department and really showcase what your team is doing to um, help improve outcomes for their patients. And keep in mind that, you know, I know that we're not on site very much right now, but, you know, many of these things, if not all of them, can be done in a remote type of setting. So that platform that we're using today, Zoom or conference calls, uh, any of this stuff can be provided via that remote platform. So just because we can't schedule an on-site visit, please reach out to your CPC to schedule a virtual type of visit and chat with them more about what you guys can do to keep the programs uh, going with your facilities. You really also need to know the facility needs, right? So we want to align any education that we're providing with what the facility is focusing on and making sure that you know from all the stakeholders uh, that what their idea is of a focus for the building, right? So they need to be involved in the decision-making progress. So anywhere from the administrator down to the therapy staff, uh, everybody should have a little bit of input and are seeing different things. How do we identify program needs in the facility? We might take a look at the quality measure reports. That can be helpful. We also may take a look at a QAPI plan. Perhaps there has been a recent survey and the facilities working on a certain area because they got tagged or um, had a deficiency. Nursing Home Compare is also a great website to check uh, in on your five-star quality measure scores. That might be an area that the, that the facility might choose to focus on. And really, once that facility finds a focus, uh, that's going to be where you consult with your CPC and take a look at what educational opportunities are available to support that focus. So whether it be therapy training, it might be nursing training, it might be getting the marketing team involved, uh, things like that. And we can help you guys focus and come up with a plan for the remaining uh, part of the year. If there are multiple programs that need addressing, creating kind of a master training schedule, looking ahead, seeing uh, we want to rank them, you want to prioritize what's most important to the building and work your way down from that. When you try to in incorporate too many programs at one time, that can be a little overwhelming. And we find that there isn't a, a huge amount of su success when we're spreading ourselves too thin. So knowing your team's educational needs. So in the, in the department itself, you know, when you're planning and coordinating with your CPC well in advance of the scheduled visit date, that's something that's super important, right? So the CPC wants to make each visit, whether it's a virtual visit or whether it's an on-site visit, as beneficial as possible for your staff and as efficient for you guys. We know that efficiency is crucial. Your time is of the, of the essence right now. So if you have new staff, right, that need to be trained, contract staff or PRN staff, um, making sure that they are included on the opportunities that, that are around, right? So whenever possible, when a training is gonna take place, have all the staff present if, if you're able. If they're not able to be present or if you have part-time or PRN staff, uh, you know, we have online courses that are available that they can attend that can help fulfill some of that uh, education for them. So ACP University, our live webinar series, I'm gonna show you how to access those uh, a little bit later in the course. Um, it is also important that you know your own company's policy related to on-site or online clinical education. Some companies will allow uh, these trainings to be on the clock or partially on the clock. Others require them to be at, you know, on their own time. So understanding what your company will allow for will again help, help to prepare for the visit and um, be able to get the most out of these visits. If there are key high priority trainings for the building, 
please make sure you're sharing that information uh, and, and welcoming them to attend any or all of, all of, all of the trainings. So that's, again, from the administrator, admissions, you know, and everybody kind of in between. So making sure everybody's aware that the trainings are taking place. Um, and so everyone can kind of be on the same page with what's, what's going on in the facility. If we do have that, that one particular program and we've identified a program champion, um, that's again something that might want a little bit of extra training on how that program champion, how that lead clinician you know, in your OT or PT team can really help drive that particular program. And that can actually take some of the pressure off of you as the manager if they're kind of running the ship with, with an individual program. So there are um, also opportunities for you as a manager to help your therapist identify potential patients uh, that might be appropriate for the programming. So many of managers are already uh, attending meetings where acute patient needs or issues are, are discussed. Uh, we're looking at changes in condition potentially, and these are really a great potential source of therapy screens. So a lot, a lot of times we are already doing this. If there is a particular program that you're running, let's say it's a wound he healing program, there definitely are meetings that are taking place that would be beneficial for you to go to, right? Skin breakdown meeting, maybe it's a wound care rounds that might be helpful to send your you know, program champion to. Um, so attending these on a regular basis is, is important for sure. And that can help drive some of the, the program identification. Using reports like your PASPER report, the quality measures, to again kind of go through that list and, and see who's triggering in certain areas. And we can help you analyze the different metrics that might lend well to um, a patient's uh, being involved in, in a specific program. So I'm going to spend a, a, several minutes on this slide. And, and with identifying patients during your regular rehab meetings and discussions with your staff, and really, when you make ACP, in general, a standard discussion point when talking about patients, it's a huge way to help the therapist who might be struggling with identification of appropriate candidates, right? And it can be important how that question is also asked, okay? So if, for example, you're having a discussion with your therapist and they're saying, oh, the patient's in a lot of pain, they're just not gonna, willing to participate, maybe asking them, well, what modality are you using to treat the pain, right? If you know we have these tools to, that, and all of them do, or many of them do address pain, which one are you using, right? In that, framing it in that way kind of sets that expectation that those modalities should be considered, right, in that kind of situation, versus kind of the yes, no answer, are you using modalities with that patient? Right. They can say no. And some, you know, sometimes managers will just, you know, be on the way. OK, you know, versus asking the deeper questions. Again, another specific thing you could ask if the patient is low level, they're very weak. It's hard to get them to participate. Well, which Easton program are you using to help with strength? Right. That will, again, get the therapist to start thinking, well, yeah, maybe maybe I could be using Easton for strength. Uh, and so, again, some of those pointed questions that you know, you're getting these barriers and you know, reasons that patients can't participate or they're having slow progress. You know, these are ways that we can you know, help that clinician identify maybe some other treatment avenues. Other probing types of questions can help identifying more physiological deficits. So um, peeling that onion layer back, this is an analogy that I use a lot with my clinicians, you know, digging a little bit deeper, right? So let's say that that patient has a limitation where they're a maxicist to transfer, right? Why are they a maxicist, right? Let's dive deeper. Do they have some chronic or acute pain that we can address with a modality? Are there joints that are limited in range of motion that might be contributing to their inability to stand up? Maybe the muscle groups are weak. Have we tried ESTEM to help with that? Maybe their quality of movement, they don't have coordination, they're lacking that timing piece, maybe something like the pattern you send put out. So kind of you know, diving and, and looking more closely at the physiological deficits can really help patients or help therapists identify um, you know, other areas, other, other 
other contributing factors that they can address uh, that will help with uh, their overall goal of maybe improving their transferability. Another common thing that we treat is your as patients who are falling, we get lots of referrals that you know for falls, right? So many of them are repeat offenders, you know, and it sometimes can be hard. Can, can be hard for clinicians to look past maybe a dementia diagnosis where there's little carryover, right? So when we ask our therapists who are evaluating a patient like this, ask them more about the physiological deficits that they're finding, right? So what did they find in the eval that could be contributing to the falling? Have you assessed not only strength, but pain, range of motion, coordination, and posture? Those are all areas that we potentially could treat maybe despite they have a cognitive deficit, right? When you think about a patient who's fallen and you realize that, oh, they forgot to lock their wheelchair, they have dementia, they have no carryover, there's no way that, that we can teach them, they're not going to uh, be able to learn a new task and in, in lock in their wheelchair. Well, you know, if you and I stood up from an unlocked wheelchair, we wouldn't fall. Why did this patient fall? looking again closer at that physiological deficit that might be happening. You might discover that the patient has poor ankle range of motion and is unable to bring their, their feet underneath their knees in order to stand up safely. Is that range of motion something that we can address with our interventions, using a modality or not using a modality, whatever it might be, to improve their safety when they know we're gonna stand, when we know they're gonna stand up without using their locks, their wheelchair locks anyway, right? So can we make them safer despite the fact that they're gonna have poor safety awareness uh, by addressing some of these physiological deficits? And certainly if you have questions or if you have a treatment that didn't work, you know, have, you, have they contacted their CPC? Can we provide some maybe other ideas and other options? So please always you know, encourage them to reach out to us or our remote clinical services uh, line in order to get some additional ideas. Uh, sometimes, you know, therapists will call and feel like they've tried everything and we might be able to give them some insight on some other ways to look at the situation and potential treatment ideas for them. Another very important thing for you as a, a manager to address and ask questions about is the frequency of application, particularly for the modalities. Uh, as with any therapy technique, there does need to be a minimum level of intensity and frequency in order to maintain and see those optimal outcomes. Providing a modality treatment PRN or, or intermittently is just not as effective. If you think about it outside of a modality perspective, would you do a therapeutic exercise or gait training only once a week? or every other week and expect to see improvements? Your answer would probably be no. And so that should be the same type of mentality we should have when we're looking at applying and utilizing the modalities to help address uh, physiological impairments. Most often, the biophysical agents are used adjunctively uh, as a part of the treatment plan. And really, we want to try to start them as early as possible. That's gonna be another factor that will help improve outcomes, right? We don't want to use a modality as kind of a means to an end. Oh, I've tried everything else. Now I'm going to try to address X, Y, Z with the modality. Starting it out at the beginning is going to be your best chances of getting the optimal outcomes in an efficient uh, time frame. And knowing that all of the instruction that we're providing, whether it's verbal in a consult consultative fashion or in our trainings, is based on evidence in the literature. And that evidence does suggest specific treatment parameters and frequency recommendations. So encouraging your staff to adhere to those recommendations is going to be helpful. Often we'll find that when we assess frequency, a modality will be on a plan of care and they're so, oh yeah, I'm using that E-STEM um, on, on them for pain. And we look back and they've used it once in the last two weeks. And so, that frequency isn't there in order to address really that pain issue. So it is quite important to uh, ask that question and make sure the therapists are thinking about that frequency parameter. So I do wanna show you a few tools. This is uh, one of three tools that I will be sending in the follow-up uh, documentation. 
So this particular one is called a resident clinical need tool. This is an older tool that we have, but I still think it has great value. And so basically it's, it's giving a list of questions that are related to a common theme, a common program perhaps. And if the therapist kind of checks off on any of, any of the items that are in that list, th those patients might be a potential uh, therapy candidate for these programs. So it can be very helpful with new therapists who are just still getting to know what the modalities and what the programs are all about and who might be appropriate for them and can really help them improve independent identification. I've su suggested also that this be used sometimes prior to discharge, just to make sure that, you know, if they're being discharged for not progressing anymore, as an example, that we are making sure that we're addressing all treatment possibilities uh, and that we're entertaining that, you know, every, every potential program option for that patient before they are being discharged. Our ADL assessment tool, I really like this tool. This one dives a little bit deeper than the previous one. So this can help identify, help clinicians dive a little bit deeper, deeper peel that onion layer back again, and really help identify that root cause of the patient's functional ability or disability, okay? So therapists often will focus their treatment solely on improving the functional task, right? I'm working on my transfer training. I'm working on my walking. But we also need to realize that if we don't address underlying physiological deficits, then we may never be able to improve their overall function uh, with those transfers or gait. If we don't improve maybe their range of motion or their um, muscle strength. So with this particular um, tool, you have a, an ADL kind of presentation, if you will, right? Or so you've got, if the patient is having trouble, trouble with a sit to stand, if they're presenting in any of these ways, right? What could be the muscles that are weak in this column? And what could be the joints that have limitations in range of motion? So just kind of guides that therapist into looking a little bit deeper, thinking a little bit more about that physiological deficit so that they can potentially treat those in order to contribute to an improvement in that patient's function. And then the last tool here is, is a, one of our brand new tools called the GG Crosswalk tool. So this is, again, kind of moving and being a little bit more um, detailed with the recommendations. So it is based on GG items, right, and, and a focus amongst those items. And it provides possible protocol ideas to address specific impairments, right? So you do have your GG item, you know, listed right, possible impairments that they may have, right, and then you also have a potential protocol or, or treatment modality or technology integration idea um, pretty broadly stated, right, ultrasound or e-stem might be helpful for strengthening. Sometimes it might say something specific like a PENS, but it's not going to give you the location or the frequency or any of that type of stuff. If you need further guidance on potentially what uh, more details on a, a placement or that kind of thing, that's where you would need to reach out to your CPC and discuss more specifics about the, the individual patient. But these can be an excellent guidance for the therapists that are unsure if programming technology or anything would benefit their patients. They can take a look at this. And this is, I think, a four or six page document in total. So, when we look at, this is kind of my summary slide page, you know, just kind of reviewing some of the things that we talked about. You know, as a manager, we just want to ensure that patients are getting the optimal treatment interventions and care and that we're, we're exhausting all of our tools to help our patients get better, right? To ultimately improve their quality of life and their functional mobility, right? That, that why behind we, you know, decided to become therapists. We really want to support that. So make sure that we're asking the questions, right? If there has been a specific recommendation made by a consultant, are you following up with that therapist to make sure they're being implemented? If they're not being implemented, ask why not? Um, there may be a very valid reason, but maybe there it might constitute or lend well to another consultative call to discuss different options. 
making ACP technology and programming a regular agenda item during your meetings, bringing it up, um, does set a, a level of expectation that they should be considered in the plan of care for your patients. Probing those, those clinicians with, you know, that peeling that onion, those onion layers back, doing that, challenging them to think a little bit more deeply. Ask about the frequency of application. Sometimes scheduling is, is difficult. If there's a really popular device that you guys have, uh, you don't want the excuse that, oh, I wanted to use it on my patient, but uh, it was already taken or it wasn't available. If you're getting that kind of feedback, Ask your CPC for some ideas on help, help with scheduling. Maybe you need an additional device in your, in your department because it is being used uh, on such a regular basis. So those are things that your CPC can help work through with you. Be knowledgeable of the program utilization or lack of utilization. You don't want to be a surprise to you when your CPC comes in and takes a look at, at the utilization and the, the, the reports and says, you, you realize that only three units of of modalities were billed last month. You know, what? I didn't realize that. So you want to kind of keep tabs on it on a regular basis so you're not caught off guard. Um, and, and so you can continue to drive the programs on a regular basis. Again, when, when possible, have all staff, staff attend all sessions. Seek out success stories, celebrate those successes, and let your CPC know so we can formulate some uh, success stories that you can share and display in your facilities. And always contact your CPC immediately as needs arise. Don't wait until a visit to bring up an issue with your equipment or your uh, patient question. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go into a building and say, oh, by the way, our lead wires have been bad and we haven't been able to use eSTEM for three weeks. You know, we could have had that issue resolved within a couple of days had um, they reached out to us to get to uh, get a new set of uh, lead wires, for example. So just make sure that you're um, keeping us in the loop on everything that's going on. And this last slide here is just making sure that you know how to access all of your resources, right? So using your CPC as an extension of your team, you should have their contact information handy. I've often recommended programming my number into their cell phone so they don't have to go searching for it. A quick text um, is great, but if you have to search for the phone number uh, beforehand, you may not, you may forget about it and it falls off your radar. So make sure that you have that contact information handy uh, so that you can reach out when you need to. The Partner Resource Center, available through acplus.com. I am gonna uh, go over how to access that and kind of what's on there for you next. Um, but there's just an idea of some of the things that are on that website for you. You do actually also have access to ACP University through that, that um, Partner Resource Center. So we'll kind of go through that, but that's a great resource for your clinicians who maybe are PRN or they're contractors and they want to um, get some of the ACP training to become more knowledgeable on the, on the technology so that they can integrate it when they're in your buildings uh, and they can do it on their own time. It's, it's a great benefit to the partnership. And of course, we have our remote clinical services for any ACP related questions. It's our standard 1 800 number, option two. We also have uh, ACP clinical questions at hangar.com. Uh, Kelly had mentioned these, uh, this contact information previously, but those are a great way to get in touch with someone uh, if you cannot get in touch with your CPC with questions related to patients or the technology. Okay, I'm going to. Go to a new share here, Kelly, so I can, of course it's not up. Let's see here. Alrighty. Ah, just a minute. Okay, Kelly, I'm gonna go to a new share. Are there any questions while I'm pulling this up? Um, there's no questions, but certainly at the end, I would like to encourage um, just because we're talking about optimizing ACP and, and, and programming, you know, I will encourage people to raise their hands so that we can sort of have an interactive discussion. There are clinicians and directors of rehab, and I recognize a regional's name, so it would be nice if anyone has anything to offer that we um, 
you know, can unmute them and, and have a little bit of an interactive discussion. But right now, nothing, Manda. Okay, great. So um, this is our acplus.com main website. At the very top, you'll see a partner login. And if you go to the partner login, uh, your CPC will have your facility specific customer ID, so I'm just going to put in one that I'm familiar with here. Your password is going to be your facility zip code, okay? So I'm going to enter in that. And once we get into the main resource page, you'll notice a number of things on the, the left-hand side here. The, the new ACP webinar series that Kelly had mentioned earlier, um, we will have our the, that home page listed there. Um, as well as the, the current calendar. So if I were to click on the June calendar as an example, you will find um, kind of a live calendar here uh, with all of the options that we have for the month, some of which are CE related, some are not. But if you were to, let's say you wanted to attend uh, one of the trainings down here, you would, just like you probably did for this one, click on there, you'll have the opportunity to, to register for that. Uh, so that's a great, a lot, many of the CPCs or all of them should be sharing this information with uh, the DORs and regionals uh, already. So, but you do have access to that uh, webinar series there. A number of COVID related resources um, are, is a section there. The ACP University I mentioned being able to tap into it from this resources page. If you have not registered for it, you would click on the registration page. And then you're going to have to fill out a form, which will pop up here. And the form, you will need that same customer ID, the facility ID there. You'll fill the rest of this out. And you're going to submit it to um, hit the submit button or request access button. And once you do that, uh, CEU 360 is going to uh, cross-reference your facility ID with an act to make sure it's an active partner of ours. And then you will get sent a welcome email. Uh, which comes from help at ceu360.com. Uh, sometimes that goes to your junk mail, so make sure you're checking that, but um, that should come within a, a day or two. If you do not receive that, you can certainly reach out to your CPC or the remote clinical services line, and we can help get you guys uh, finished with the registration process. The other things that are available on here, there is a media library. You can see that it, it has all of our technology here that you can tap into. And if you wanted to get some, um, there's some videos here on the OmniCycle as an example, if I click there. Nope, my pictures aren't coming up here. Let's see. Try another one. Library. Try to dive for me. See what we get there. Huh. It's wanting to take a long time to load there. Um, anyway, there are some uh, you know, videos on, on in that section there. The clinical tips that your CPC should be sending out to you on a monthly basis uh, are available here for downloading as well. So if you wanted to click on, let's say, a cardiopulmonary topic, you'll see we've got five in this particular menu. Uh, you can print print them out, and then you can distribute them uh, to your teams. If, or if you needed to review them or just want to take a look at them, the CPC can review them in, in detail with your teams as well. So there's a, all of our programs have specific, uh, so they've broken them down via program, which is nice. Your clinical resources is going to give you a load of different information and videos uh, as well. So if you have a new piece of equipment that you haven't quite been able to get trained on or a new therapist that doesn't know how to use something. Um, as an example, here's an Omni stand. Yeah, that you'll see a number of different videos showing you uh, with different topics and you can kind of, you know, they're pretty short in nature, so they shouldn't take too much time to go through, but that can be helpful with the training process if you have new staff or just need a little bit of, of additional information. We also have our live course handouts available. So if you are interested in a certain topic, haven't had that, uh, can't get in touch with your CPC to have them send things to you, you can actually um, go on these if I wanted to say pull up contracture management. And get rid of my, get rid of this one, weed those out for you. 
So you'll see with you know, each of the programs, you'll get your syllabus, a lecture with two slides per page, a lab, um, extended lab if there is one, appendix, and bibliography. And you can click on these and download them and get the information that you need. This is particularly helpful with the lab section uh, where the, you have the pictures and the protocols right there. Your user's manuals are here as well as, your, as some marketing resources too. So lots of great information on this Partner Resource Center. I encourage you guys to check it out. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out.